Buick and Opal were uh, connected. I think they still are. This is made in Germany. And when we went to the gas crisis, they had to come up quick with small cars. So they were importing these little Opals. And my sister had one. Had a little four cylinder in there, 2000 cc's. Or maybe 1900. That really hauled ass for a little car like that. But never ran proper. Yeah, you'd run fine at one stop sign, come to the next stop sign, it would be chugging and, and uh, take it to the dealership. They'd have it running. You drive away a block and all of a sudden blah, 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 it'd be running like crap. Took it to a guy that was my friend. When we worked at the golf course, he was the guy that took care of the groundskeeping. He goes underneath the air cleaner, pulls this plastic thing out. He had one, put it underneath there, hitched the vacuum lines to it. It was ran like a cat's ass after that. People would freak out. These little, they had the same engine in the Opal GT. And you get a car pretty cheap like this, and it was reliable. You could fit in here pretty good. Some of the little cars were so small they were uncomfortable. Here we find a Hurst old. The engine tranny's out of it. First thing my partner goes is, let's check out, see if it has the lightning rods. I go, you like them? Well, it was a gimmick. When pro stock racing was going on, they had transmissions that you just kept on pulling, and um, they were strong and they held up for pro stock. So they emulated this because Warren Johnson used to have an uh, Oldsmobile pro stock or funny car. And they put these lightning rods. All it was was an automatic shifter that you just pulled three different levers to make it move up the cogs of the shifter. But people would think they had a different transmission. They're a gimmick, but they're not in here. So when you get to the furthest part of the junkyards, usually the oldest stuff is sitting way back there. It's been in here for years. This is another Opal, and the engine's out of it. But some people call it a poor man's vet. And people that had a vet go, don't even think about calling it a poor man's vet. That thing's a piece of crap. Well, they were actually kind of cool because guys would put a small block Chevy up front. It was just a body. I could have had one, but somebody wasn't paying their storage fee. They owed $2,500, and I was just ready to buy this thing. It was tubbed out, had big wheels and everything, and uh, custom paint on it. And the girlfriend came up with the money and paid for the storage, and then I didn't get it. Uh, this is a gremlin. I think I've told stories in the past about how my brother had a Gremlin X. It was black with gold stripes. It was pretty fast, actually, for a AMC. People would be freaked out when you'd beat them with a, a Gremlin. They had, like, a Camaro or a Mustang. I think this was a Gremlin X. It's got stripes on it and stuff. Yeah, it looks like it. See this X right here, and the stripe went down. Then they went into goofy stripes going up. Some of them would have little accents right here. What happened was they were so short that you'd be into a corner at high speeds, and all of a sudden, Rah! they'd spin out on you. But they were good for straight line. If you ever want to see the coolest gremlin ever, you look up a name called Brian Ambrosini. And when we go down to um, Byron, Illinois, for the wheel, wheel stand contest. He knows how to drive that so good. He says he's got like 14 of them. And he stands it on the back bumper. Usually they just put aluminum bolts on the back bumper because it looks cool when the bumper breaks off. And he stands it up and he rides it all the way down the track. So when Datsun came out with the 240Z, it was really a cool car. It was just a two-seater chopped off in the back. Then they started getting bigger, 260. This is 280, and they're starting to be more of a luxury car than a sports car. And then most people know about the 300 Nissan. That's what they changed their name from Datsun to Nissan. And that's actually a pretty cool car too, but uh, this is the roots of it way back in the 70s. It's not the same. Open that door once. It's kind of a cool dash. Now, they were really cool. The neighbor across the street had one. So, I know this might offend people, but Japan was always known as good copiers. 
okay? And at the time, the only sports car you could get was from Italy or Britain. And the English cars, they were cheap. Electronics and the carburetors, both were bad. And also in the Japanese, they make stuff that's very reliable. And they came out with this Datsun 240Z. <laughs> Everybody quit buying Triumphs and MGs and stuff because those things were just, you had to have a full-time mechanic to take care of them. If it was a Fiat, they called it Fix It Again, Tony, because those things were expensive to fix. You'd be waiting for parts from Italy, and people got frustrated with them. All of a sudden, you can buy this little Japanese sports car, and they handled great. What they had for power, motivation was a straight six-cylinder, torquey. You can see, this is after the carburetors, they had fuel injection, but um, they were a simple little car, and man, your butt was almost dragging on the ground, it felt cool going through corners, and America just had big, giant, you know, cars like what we're working on, and some people like a small little car, they got better gas mileage, it could cut corners really good and uh, they were reliable. So if you know anybody that ever bought a Jaguar, they'll probably tell you about the thousand of headaches they had with them. They leaked oil, electrical problems, and my buddy ended up taking one back on the Lemon Law. It was like in 84, because they couldn't stop the oil leaks. Sometimes you go out and wouldn't start. You'd have to have it towed back to the shop. He wasn't a mechanic. He just wanted to drive a nice car. And Jaguars were like a step up for the luxury man, you know. But the only thing I said was worth taking out of a Jaguar is the rear end. And you'll see them underneath a lot of hot rods. They were independent rear suspension and they moved the brakes to the inside. Like a Corvette still has the brakes going along for a ride when you hit a bump. And the unsprung weight is going up and down with the wheels. Well, if you move the brakes to the inside, and then if you have a fancy, uh, tea bucket or whatever and you got this whole polished out and painted rear end and it looks high tech with independent rear suspension guys you know if you got a rear end for cheap underneath a car like this put it in a street rod it looks kind of cool this thing's been sitting here a long time it looks like it's a 39 dodge and you can tell when it's got full glass instead of the little split windows in the back that looked like a beetle bug and a Ford just had a straight post going up, and this, there's not much left of them. Usually these always rusted out. In the 30s you had a separate fender, and then they had this stuff called fender welt. And it was like, you could buy even fancy stuff, chrome. But who wants to show the split line? Some people did. And you'd put that in between so metal wasn't rubbing on metal, and it bolted together. So water sat in between here and this is where they all rot out so usually when you got one of these cars you had to fix that whole strip so your fenders had something to bolt up to but when guys would get cars like a 40 ford or a, preferably a 41 willys then they made cool looking gassers the kind with the straight axle and pop wheelies everybody likes those so you can tell when we're at the very back of the um, junkyard when you have a lane of Corvairs. This was my first cool ride in a car. Imagine you have a father that drives Ramblers. They were nothing. They just got you from point A to point B. My buddy's older brother was in going to Madison High, uh, College in Wisconsin and he comes back and we're gonna go down to the liquor store to get something, you know, junk food or whatever. We got to ride with him. So you gotta figure this guy's 18 to 20 or whatever, and he's got his own Corvair. And I could hardly see over the dash because I was only about 12 years old. And it had a four speed, and they weren't, you know, monster muscle cars, but to have a ride in a car where it's not like your dad driving, whipping around corners, and he's shifting gears, and we'd be falling back in the seats. And it was like, man, this is cool. Then I had my, you know, car fever where I like cars after that. And then as you're going to school and you had Matchbox and Hot Wheels, then each kid would say, my dad's got a 
Galaxy 500 with a 390, you know, kick your dad's ass, you know, and everybody bragged about what their dad had because we couldn't drive yet. We didn't have our license, but you were proud of what your dad had. And then everybody watched racing on TV and what, what won on Sunday, everybody bragged about it, you know, on Monday at school, you know, that the Ford won or the Chevy won or Pontiac won. So it was more interesting. They were more like real cars back when NASCAR was early. This is the car that uh, Ralph Nader said unsafe at any speed. He was just trying to get all auto manufacturers to put seat belts in. He didn't want to put seat belts in or they'd be admitting that driving a car is unsafe. It used to be when you go out in a car, they had a steel dash and they had package trays underneath. People would have you know, door handles that stuck out. And when you got in an accident, you were getting punctured by armrests and uh, your knees would get hacked up on the package tray underneath. They had to really clean up a lot of stuff on cars now. You got steering wheels that had big pads and they had breakaway columns that collapse. Now you got front you know, hoods that fold up. All this stuff is mandated by government and it's a good thing except when you gotta fix the stuff you know and they just get tapped a little and hoods bend up and well, this is a whole F-body city, man. They're just all stacked up with Fieros also. That's the Fiero section over there. I just thought it would be cool if somebody that was a subscriber knew anybody that had something like this. I never even saw a Subaru all-wheel drive little sedan. Well, it's pretty straight. It's not smashed at all. I wonder what made it be totaled out. I want you guys to check out this door handle. It goes like this and it's it's flush. Well, it looks like a good. finger trap. It's pretty cool. Kind of reminds me of the Pontiac Fiero, the 80 square boxy look but it's actually a nice fitting car it feels good I hope some of our subscribers knew somebody that had one of these and can tell us if it was a cool car we'll see what it's like to operate one of these things Holy shit, you could not be fat and drive one of these. I got the steering wheel in my gut. There. Holy shit. You can see everything pretty cool. Holy shit. A lot of hornets. A lot of levers. Levers all over the place. Everything's froze up. This is, this is what junkyards need, is they can move stuff around, articulate, get in between all this stuff, pick up scrap and dump it in the trucks. Yeah. Put that wave runner there right in the river, next to that boat. Unbelievable. I bet they own that property too, or somebody would be bitching. There's a few of my snowmobiles back here. You'd ask if you could just dump your stuff off and they'd tell you where to go. Then you just, after you pulled and pulled and pulled on that starter and didn't go and then the recoil breaks and finally it's something that just puts you over the top and you say, screw it, I'm getting rid of this thing. And you're taking it to the junkyard and you push it off the back of your truck and I'm gonna see if I find it. It's there. I think this is a limo here, isn't it? how long it is. The one in back is a limo. That's where you got the middle space and then they put, you know, you can see where they stretched it in the middle. You find some weird shit in the junkyards and this would be perfect for a kid. It's like a cab over semi 
Must have a Briggs and Stratton engine on it. Well, I couldn't fit in it. But it's got little trailer tires on it. Looks pretty cool. Can you imagine bombing around the yard with that thing? The old man was probably a truck driver. You can see that's like off a lawnmower. There's all the boats. Holding tank when you have an RV and then you take your showers or you flush the toilet and there's shit and piss in it. And then you gotta go to the holding tank at the campgrounds and you drain it. Well, there was a band called the Dave Matthews Band. And they were going across a bridge in Chicago and they thought, oh, this would be a perfect time to dump our shit pot. And they dropped the valve, you know, and just let it go across this screen, you know, a metal bridge. But little did they know there was a tour bus going on underneath and they all got swamped with sewage. And they found out who owned this RV. And Dave Matthews got in trouble. You can tell this was a party bus. Can you imagine this floating down the river and all the guys in there drinking beer? I wonder what they were doing, shooting carp or what? If you ever find one of these from 1948 to 52, 53, these old Willis Jeeps, most guys get rid of the flathead four-cylinder and they put a small block Chevy in them. These come in once they're all finished. A lot of guys love them. Well, that's off of a Ford. These were on the uh, Galaxies and stuff back in the 60s. We just called it the teardrop scoop. This is kind of like the truck that's up north that we were going to be working on. It was the barn find truck. I don't know if there's any parts. You can tell when it's a one ton, it's got different type rims. Heavy duty, this one's a four wheel drive, ours is just two wheel drive. 